Let's talk about the black body radiation spectrum. This was one of the most important things, well, a lot of important things came out of the 19th century, but this was a very, very, very important thing that came out of the 19th century. So here's the idea. When things are in thermal contact, what that means is that they're bumping into each other, having collisions, and sharing energy. So if I've got a hot liquid and a cold liquid and I pour them together, then the hot liquid is gonna give some of its energy to the cold liquid, so the cold liquid will get hotter and the hot liquid will get colder until they're at the same temperature. And that's what thermal contact does. Now, when they get into the same temperature, that's thermal equilibrium. And the easy way to think about thermal equilibrium is everybody gets his share, all right? So when you're in thermal equilibrium, all the atoms get the same amount of energy provided that they're using it. There's all these little rules that I don't want to talk about right now, but you can think about it that way. So what about light? I mean, if I'm talking about atoms and they're interacting with each other, atoms consist of electrons and nuclei, and those things are charged. So they ought to interact with the electromagnetic field, so that means that they ought to be able to give some energy to electromagnetic waves. So doesn't light get to play? Yes, light gets to play. And that's a major, major thing, because what that means is that everything that has a finite temperature, everything, in order to be in thermal equilibrium, it's gotta give some of its energy to light. And of course, what does light do when you give it energy? It leaves. It's not just gonna sit around. It's not, you know, attracted to the matter. It doesn't care, it's just going off. It's like a light bulb. You turn it on and the light leaves, right? So here's the idea. Every object that has a finite temperature is always radiating energy. And this energy just comes from the thermal equilibrium. It comes from the temperature itself. So it's just radiating. I'm radiating energy right now, light energy. So when we go ahead and measure the intensity of the light that's coming off versus the wavelength, we get these real interesting curves. The red curve is for a hot object. The blue curve is for a cooler object. Notice that the red curve has a lot more energy, a lot more intensity. So that means that hotter objects give off a lot more light than cooler objects do. All right, similarly, we find that there's a little peak here. Notice that the cooler object peaks at a higher wavelength than the hotter object does. So what that means is that as an object gets hotter, it not only radiates more just overall, it also starts to radiate at lower wavelengths. So here, this one wasn't radiating very much at that wavelength before, but then we heat it up, and now that becomes the maximum radiation. All right, so that's the way that black body radiation works. These curves are extremely important. They actually led Planck to, um, to propose photons. That's where photons come from. They come from this black body radiation spectrum. Now you can also understand this just kind of qualitatively if you've ever seen an electric range. You turn it on, turn it up to high, and what happens? How do you know it's hot? Well, the filament is glowing, right? It starts glowing red. So that's an indication that it's hot. That means that the wavelength of peak emission has moved over far enough that you can actually see visible light. See, at my temperature right now, I'm still radiating, but I'm not radiating in the visible spectrum. You gotta be pretty hot to radiate in the visible spectrum. All right, let's get quantitative on this. There's two major, major, major formulas that are associated with the black body radiation formula. Now, I'm not gonna write up Planck's formula because it's kind of complicated, but these are two things that are derived from it. First one is the Stefan Boltzmann law, and that tells you how much energy per unit time or how much power is emitted by something that has temperature T. So it tells us that power is equal to sigma. Sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann law constant, and you can measure it or you can calculate it from fundamental constants. It's 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth, all right? Now that unit, of course, you can get just by saying the power has to be watts. And look what I'm multiplying by. This is the area, the surface area of the object. Obviously, if it's bigger, it's gonna radiate more. I mean, think about the Earth. 
right? The earth is radiating through every little piece of its surface area. So it's a lot bigger than a beach ball. So I would expect it to radiate a lot more energy. So that's why the area is there. And then we have this E. This is called the emissivity. And you can basically think about it in terms of like greenhouse gases, right? The earth emits energy, but then some of it's bounced back. So that would make the amount that it's actually emitting less. Okay, so this is the emissivity. All right, it's between zero and one. All right, and then we have the temperature. And what's weird about this is that the temperature is to the fourth power. Most of the time we just see things squared, at best cubed. But this is temperature to the fourth power. And it's also the Kelvin temperature. It is not degrees Celsius. It's not degrees Fahrenheit, certainly. It's Kelvin temperature. Now, as you remember from chemistry, Kelvin temperature is Celsius temperature plus 273. Now, what's interesting about that is that room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. So when you look at this number and you say, oh, it's 10 to the minus 8, that's not very much power at all. Think about the fact that you're then going to multiply it by 300 to the fourth power. All right? So that actually makes this power fairly large. Um, anyway, so that's the first equation. The second one is Wien's displacement law. Now, this tells us how we can calculate the wavelength associated with maximum intensity if we know the temperature. So he tells us that lambda max is equal to 2.898 millimeter Kelvin, and that's just a constant. You could measure it uh, in experiment, divided by the temperature. Again, that temperature has to be in Kelvin. All right. So let's just go ahead and do some examples. So a human being has a body temperature, internal body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That translates to 310 Kelvin. So Wien's displacement law tells us that the maximum wavelength is 9.35 micrometers. So this is a microwave. You can't see it. It's not visible. It's in the far infrared. All right. But that's how thermal imaging works. And that's how those heat goggles work. You look at something and you're looking at this part of the spectrum. And at this part of the spectrum, all human beings are like light bulbs. They're just radiating. All right. So we've got that for human. Let's get hotter. What about molten iron? Now you guys know that when you heat up iron enough that it starts to melt, it starts to show that red. It starts to glow, right? So the temperature at which iron melts is 1810 Kelvin. Using Wien's displacement law, we see that the maximum wavelength of emission is at 1600 nanometers. Now that's not visible. It's infrared. The, the highest wavelength that we can see as human beings is about 700 nanometers. So this is a little bit more than twice that. However, as you remember from the curves, the maximum is not the only wavelength that's being emitted. It emits at smaller wavelengths too. And so it's just kind of beginning to glow that red. That's the idea because that red is about 650, 670 nanometers. All right, so that's molten iron. What about the sun? The sun has a surface temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. That's very hot. And when we use Wien's displacement law, we find a maximum wavelength emission of 500 nanometers. That's like a blue-green. So now you might ask, well, geez, I look at the sun. It doesn't look like blue-green to me. It looks yellow. There's many reasons for that. Part of the reason is that when you look at the sun, you're actually seeing that whole spectrum. And there's a lot more of the larger wavelengths than there are of the smaller ones. So you're averaging in all those reds and all those oranges and all those things like that. And that pulls what it looks like kind of further up the wavelength spectrum. The other reason is that when you're looking up at the sun, you're really only seeing the light that hasn't been scattered away by the atmosphere. If you look away from the sun, what do you see? You see blue. You see the sky. That's because the majority of the light that's scattered by the atmosphere is the small wavelength stuff. So that stuff's going away. What's left over? The bigger wavelengths. And that's why the sun appears yellow when you look at it. All right, and then there's one other example that I wanted to give. And this is the cosmic background radiation, which is something that's very, very, very important to physicists all around the world. Essentially, what happened was after the Big Bang, 
things interacted for a while and then everything just kind of coalesced into atoms and everything. And then the light that was remaining from the Big Bang decoupled from everything else because now everybody is neutral. So the light is just going to propagate through. The cosmic background radiation is the remnants today of that light that decoupled about 300,000 years after the beginning of the universe. Now, when we measure the intensity of the different wavelengths that come in that cosmic background radiation, we find a perfect black body spectrum. In fact, it's the most perfect one ever found in nature. Cosmic background radiation with a temperature of 2.725 Kelvin. It's been cooling off since the Big Bang. And by now, it's cooled to 2.725 Kelvin. Anyway, that's black body radiation spectrum, one of the most important things to come out of 19th century physics. And by two, I can't do this with you two laughing back there. Work it, work it. So if we had, no, that's not right, three coplanar points. So have you ever gotten off an airplane? <laughs> that should be, Less than. yeah. Dang. Is it like 500 degrees in here or what? All right, so when you're in chemistry class, you're gonna be doing a lot of work. You're gonna be bleh, starting over. So as an example, we could consider like you've got a chain hanging from two, um, two fix. Yeah. <laughs>